I'd like to try something a little different today. In my story, I'd like if my father could tell the story. And uh, let me begin with this. There's a painting that has a, an honored place in my study. This painting is an oil on canvas, which my father acquired uh, just after the Second World War. He was on a troop ship coming back from the Far East to Britain, and uh, they stopped in Italy. And this is a painting of Naples Bay. Perhaps you can see Mount Vesuvius with a plume of smoke in the background. And the story that he tells has to do with arriving in Naples. So I wanted to show you this painting. The message was given in 1980. I'm afraid I don't know exactly where he spoke it. But uh, so 33 years ago, he went to heaven in 2000. So he knows a lot more about heaven now than he did then. But uh, he, he's talking on Revelation 21, and he's just finished a little section talking about the things that aren't in heaven. No pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no tears, no crying, no night, and so on. And then he turns to this important, this crucial subject, what is in heaven. And he speaks about that for a moment, and then he asks forgiveness because he told this story many times. It's one of his great classic stories, and I know you'll love it. And, uh, and then he tells the story. So uh, perhaps you'll find a real encouragement and a little homesickness for heaven as a result of listening to this message. So uh, listen along as he tells this story. But there are some blessings that are there, and the greatest blessing of heaven, I think, is this one, and they shall see his face. That is what will make heaven for us. Oh, what a moment, dear Christian. It's so difficult for us, really, to enter into it. There will come a moment in your experience when you will open your eyes in the glory and look into that countenance of radiant majesty. Behold not the face of a stranger, but the countenance of your own Savior, the friend of sinners. To hear him speak his voice of welcome, to look into that countenance of radiant beauty, what a moment that will be. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, I know I've told this story a hundred times. Forgive me, those of you who have heard it 99 times. But I just can't help it, for it illustrates it so beautifully to me. I never seem to be able to speak about this without thinking of that outstanding experience at the end of the war. I was in Burma sitting on a jungle airstrip when my number came up for demobilization. And I flew back to Bombay to pick up a ship for home. And at last, the word came that I was going on the SS Scythia. There were 15 of us Christians had banded together there to have some meetings, and we had great plans for evangelistic services on the troop ship traveling home. That was really a captive audience. And we'd have them for three weeks. And we scrounged and begged and borrowed tracts and hymn books and Bibles until we had a few boxes full and then we got word the postings were up. We dashed over to the notice board and 14 men went on one boat and one man went on the other. And 10 guesses who that one man was. I was sitting underneath a lifeboat on the SS Sithy on the first morning and my heart was in my boots. All alone. It was an overflow ship with only 200 officers on it. And some had their wives. I was asking the Lord if somewhere there's a Christian on board this ship, help me to find him. I crawled out from underneath the lifeboat and walked back across the boat deck with my Bible under my arm. And up the stairs came a major in the Indian army with his wife. And under his arm were two Bibles. We stopped and looked at each other, just the two of us, not another soul on the deck. 
and we smile at each other. He put out his hand. He said, I see we have something in common, brother. Wonderful thing to belong to the family of God. He knew a few others and we got together, had some wonderful Bible readings. But we discovered after we were out a day, to our surprise, that we were not alone on the ship. There were 2,000 Italian prisoners of war down below. We had the run of the top deck, and they were stuffed down to the lower decks, and all they had for fresh air was a piece of deck as long as it was wide. Not much room for 2,000 men to get out. But they did come out in the evenings, and many of them had banjos, guitars, mandolins, ukuleles, whatever, and they would come out and sing. And they would sing of home, and the little boys could sing. We'll go back to the end of our deck and lean on the rail and listen to them as the sun went down and as the stars glittered overhead. It was quite a beautiful experience. But as we passed through the Red Sea and crossed over towards Italy, went through the Straits of Messina, past Old Stromboli and round by Mount Etna and came into Naples Bay, we could feel the tension building on board that ship. Those men, many of them, had not been home for uh, since before the Abyssinian War. Ten years, some of them had not been home, and now they were going home. We wondered what it was going to be like for them, because we were going home, and we were anticipating it in their return as well. The ship docked, and we could see from our vantage point the sheds, the cobblestones, and over the shed we could see a tent where the military police were, and all the men had to pass through that tent to be officially released to join their friends, Thousands of people waiting at the gates behind the iron railing in Naples Harbor. But there was a little group of 30 or 40 down here on the cobblestones. I don't know who they were or why they got in, but they were held back by a portable wooden fence. And the men started to unload. What a sight. One big fellow got to the bottom of the gangplank and he danced around in circles, shouting out, Liberty, Liberty. He was no longer a prisoner, free at last. Another fellow, when he got to the bottom, he threw down his kit bags and threw himself all his length on the ground and kissed the cobblestones. Home, sweet home. The one that moved me most of all was a young fellow, well tanned and strong, carrying two kit bags. He made his way down the gangplank towards the military police at the bottom to be directed to the tent. But halfway down the gangplank, suddenly, there was a shout of a name from someone in this little knot of people. Antonio! The man looked over, and he saw another man in that little crowd waving his arms. The fellow dropped his kit bags off his shoulders and ran down the gangplank. The military police tried to stop him, but they couldn't. He broke past them. He ran for the fence. The fence couldn't stop him, nor the people. He took a flying leap right over their heads. And he got his arms around the neck of that man. And we could hear them weeping for very joy. I don't know who it was. His dad, his brother. What do you think he was thinking about right then? Freedom? Liberty? I don't think so. Home, Italy, the Mediterranean, the sunshine, the olive groves, the grapes? I don't think so. I think what he was thinking of at that moment that filled his heart and mind was of the man he loved. You know, it'll be really something. It'll be really something to be free at last. Free of that miserable old clock that is forever chasing us along. Free of schedules. Free of this mortal flesh, this wicked heart, this old nature. Free at last to break out of it all and to be free. It'll be a wonderful thing to be free. And it'll be a wonderful thing to be there. To stand at last on the shore of heaven and look around and see sights the like of which our eyes have never yet beheld. Angels and seraphim and cherubim to behold the sights of heaven. Ah, it'll be a wonderful thing to breathe the clean, sweet air of heaven and know home at last, home at last. But oh, that's not everything. 
the most wonderful thing of all will be to see the man we love. To look in his face, to fall at his feet, and I doubt not to use the very words of Scripture. He really is. Yea, he really is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. Well, there's more, and if you'd like to hear the whole message, uh, if you go to voicesforchrist.org, and pick the speaker's connection and then go to Boyd Nicholson, page 10. Um, it's called simply Heaven, Revelation 21. And the story and some other wonderful stories as well are told there. So I uh, hope you enjoyed our little trip to Naples Bay and uh, this beautiful illustration of what it will be when at last we are home when at last we see him as he is. Uh, this is my beloved, and this is my friend. <laughs>